then obviously what we do know about footy though too is that you admire and you respect people that you come up against and it's always the playing group that has the physical side of it but Fitzy's and mine is mental and I have enormous admiration for Jim. I've actually worked with him in state games and he's very passionate about the Victorian football scene and also two players become, I would think, extensions of a coach. And I thought Fitzy's voice today for about halfway through the third quarter were absolutely tremendous. They actually taught us a little bit about playing as a team. They taught us a little bit about how physical you have to be at this level in these conditions. I thought they adapted to the conditions extremely well. They taught us about how hard you have to spread, how hard you want to reward players that get themselves into the right positions. You know, they had started in the stoppages and I think that was where the momentum shift well and truly was. Four goals in about, I think, I don't know, Fitzy, maybe five or six minutes, mate, prior to three-quarter time. And there was at no stage today that I would feel comfortable that the game was in our grasp, but I know Fitzy's boys haven't had the greatest start this year, but they are very proud and a very professional football club. And we went through a similar situation last year, round 22, I think it was, and uh, Fitzy's boys got up that day by a point. So there's lessons to be learned consistently about what you need to do. And this competition is so goddamn even, and it just all comes to what happens in that two hours. But the original statement I made about is planning and preparation. Our training form was, I would say, fairly lackadaisical, as Fitzy touched on. It was a different week with the Foxtel Cup. But that's the standards and the professions we set here. The reason why this club has been able to achieve is because it doesn't lower its standards. And when you're challenged, you've got to roll your sleeves up and actually absorb that challenge and meet that challenge. But we didn't want to do it today for whatever reason. And it was once again full credit to Fitzy's boys that once they got in front, they put the foot down and we couldn't find another gear. So the lessons that will be learned, as Jared said before, we'll take that in the next week because it is a Geelong next weekend, which is obviously a side that did touch us up in the grand final last year. So all our energies need to be put in about what we can do and what we can confront in the following week. And we'll be doing our best to take a game that we lost today away from Geelong, so we can actually get back on the winners list. So our best part of the day, it's funny, it's all about stoppage, it's all about momentum, but I thought you did extremely well. Consistently brought the ball out of the stoppages, used his nous, used his leadership, used his skill. There's no doubt he's one of the best players going around in the BFL, still at the ripe old age of 32, so Johnny Baird, our best player today. Supporters, certainly thanks to Jared and thanks to the North Ballarat Football Club and support staff. We know it is Sunday, unfortunately, and you've got to get back to Ballarat, but you can certainly go back home in a very happy mood. We'll certainly lick our wounds. There's a lot of pride within this organisation, and no doubt we'll be calling on that next week. I'd like to thank our supporters for turning up, not only on Tuesday night too, which was great to see you all there, but also too again at home. We really can't do a heck of a lot of stuff without you guys supporting us on a regular basis. It's actually absolutely tremendous, so thank you very much. TV. We're joined by the back of jumper sponsor of the Port Melbourne Football Club, Scott Aiken from uh, Atlas uh, Rent-A-Car. Uh, Scott, great to have you here. First of all, what's your uh, early impressions of the bar experience? Oh, look, it's a, it's a great, friendly, uh, family-filled atmosphere, really. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Can you tell us a little about Atlas Rent-A-Car? And I believe you're a family-owned company? Yeah, Atlas Rent-A-Car, been, uh, been in Melbourne for 25 years, owned by uh, John and Pam Murphy. Um, I've, I've worked on and off for them for, uh, for 10 years now. Um, we uh, specialise in commercial vehicles, hence uh, like the vehicle we've supplied uh, the Port Melbourne Football Club. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small team, but it's a very committed team uh, with, with, with more than 50 years' experience in the industry. 
And of course, we see on the front of the stand and the um, magnificent Atlas Renner truck that the Port Melbourne Football Club use. How did Atlas become involved with the borough? Uh, Atlas uh, became involved with with Port Melbourne through uh, through connections with with John Murphy, who's our one of our uh, our chairman, and uh, and his uh, close association with the football uh, clubs and and leagues around Victoria. And how important is it for Atlas to be involved with local football? Being a, being a locally owned company, uh, John and Pam and, and myself and, and the rest of our management team see it as a very uh, good and unique uh, opportunity for uh, us to, to be at grassroots level um, in all areas of, uh, of sponsorship and, and, and indeed football in this case. Now if people are looking to rent something from uh, Atlas uh, Truck and Car Rentals, uh, what do you have in your fleet and, and how can people go about hiring it? Sure. We, 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 uh, we operate a, a wide range of fleet, from small cars to uh, eight-ton trucks. So, um, you know, uh, you can find us on our, on our website at atlasrent.com.au or, uh, or uh, by, by phoning our reservations. Why I didn't go to Essendon was the fact that they didn't ask me. 
uh, and ironically, and ironically, the in my first year playing in the Premiership side, ironically, the team we beat was Essendon. So uh, uh, I guess that's fate, isn't it? But having said that, um, why did I go to Melbourne? Um, I went to Melbourne for a pair of footy boots. Uh, that was my signing on fee. Never fit it, never worn them. <laughs> and uh, knocked back um, a new car off of from Richmond and also a new Ford from Geelong. But the reason I went to Melbourne was that I thought that if I was ever good enough to play league football, it would be easier, even if I was good enough, to play in a, uh, in a top side. And uh, obviously that decision was um, verified uh, because I played in the Premiership in my first year as an 18 year old. Is it intimidating for the first time walking into the Melbourne Football Club because it is the oldest football club? It's home ground, it's the home of football, the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Well, it was intimidating, of course, because you mentioned earlier that they'd won 55, 56, 57. They were beaten by Collingwood in 58. Um, so the side was, was a very well established side. They uh, had some. A group of players that started in 1953 in Barassi's, the Adams, the Dixons, the Johnsons, and so forth. So they were a very experienced side. and. Uh, uh, and of course, coached by Norm Smith, the, the AFL coach of the century. Uh, just to play under him was indeed an honour. And uh, to play with the others, one had to play well to stay in the side. What was Norm Smith's demeanour like as a coach? Look, um, I could talk all day about Norm Smith as, because I think that whatever I achieved in football, uh, uh, I attribute that to Norm. He was a very, very hard taskmaster as a coach. Uh, he was very honest. He had a wonderful memory for the things that you did wrong. He <laughs> was a man of very little praise, but when he did praise you, you, you took it on board. And uh, he was one that uh, taught us. I think he was probably a great educator, and I think that not only from football, but he was a great educator of life because the principles that he instilled in us as a team, that the loyalty was very important, that the honesty was very important, that the uh, playing at your best every time you took the field was very important. Um, he was just a fantastic guy and uh, he's the only person I think in my life that would ask me to run through that brick wall and I would do it knowing that you'd knock yourself out and uh, when you came to, you'd do it again for him. And that's very, very important. The first two years you were there, you won flags, 59 and 60. You must have felt if you were walking on water. Well, 60 was a great, uh, a great result because we beat Collingwood. Everyone likes to beat Collingwood. Um, and they only kicked two goals in the grand final. And I remember coming in after the grand final, the Smithy was crooked on us because we let them kick two goals. <laughs> um, and we beat them again in 64, so that was terrific. Um, beating Collingwood any time is a great thrill. And for you personally, what honour was it to win Best and Fairest three times in such a great era for the club? Well, I think that from my... For me personally, I think the fact that uh, I beat Barassi twice in 62-63 when Melbourne was still a very, very strong side um, and to play and play well and be awarded the best and fairest against that group of players that I mentioned earlier was, uh, was certainly an honour and uh, uh, yeah, to win it in 67 when all of those players had departed and to be captain of the side and also be able to play well in a poor side was, uh, was also a, you know, a great thrill. You mentioned one name there, Ronald Dale Barassi. We hear stories of him as the coach, the firebrand coach, uh, earning a hard training session. What was he like 
and behind the scenes as a man? What was he like out there on the training track? Well, he was a very dedicated player. Look, he wasn't, I say, the best player that I played with, um, mainly because, or not because of, that he was perhaps the best or best skilled player in the side, but uh, he was the most determined player that he overcame lack of skill with endeavour. I guess you judge players on how good they are on their ability to turn a game off their own boot. Perhaps he had the ability through his determination and his desire to be uh, the very best through an action, through a, uh, through a, 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 a an abuse, if you like, sometimes. He had that ability to win games off his own boot or had the ability to do something very special in a game that was able to lift players to perform better. And when you talk of Ron Barassi, I think that the guy that was, the guy that took the most abuse from the coach was Ron. And this was, I guess, Norm Smith's uh, method of coaching, that whenever he wanted a good result or an improved result or an improved performance, he would always go to his better players. And he never, as a coach, seeking an extra effort from uh, from a team, never went to the young players, always went to the older, experienced players. This is where Ron, and I guess uh, myself, I got my fair share as captain also. Um, he was an outstanding, outstanding leader of men, Barassi. Let's talk about one time there at the Melbourne Football Club. But, um, it was a controversial period in 65 where Norm Smith was dismissed and later reinstated. Uh, there was inquisitions, there was football specials on at the time over this game. What was the feeling like in the playing group that the legendary Norm Smith had been at that stage given his marching orders? Well, the... it was interesting that I was talking to Norm, I've told this story many times, and many of you have heard me say this, but as captain I was talking to Norm uh, at 9 o'clock in the evening on a Friday night, which was a common occurrence because he'd always ring up and say that we're playing so-and-so tomorrow and these are the tactics we're going to use and employ. And uh, through our conversation I heard the, the, the front doorbell ring and he excused himself and said, look, we've mentioned now, I've got to go, someone at the door. And it was a telegram guy who brought a message from the board of the Melbourne Football Club saying that Ron was sacked. I recall, after I hung up from uh, the phone, phone call, I went and had a, I was having a glass of milk and the phone rang again. And it was this, 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 this guy that was crying. And uh, he said, and the voice said, the tactics I we spoke about, you'll have to do it yourself. I've, I've just been sacked. And I said, I thought it was some crank. And I said, you know, get off the phone, you stupid bastard. <laughs> but it was Norm. And uh, a guy of such character as Smith, to hear him crying was, 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 was something, something different. Um, if you miss me, it was him. I recall going over to Norm's place. Um, I met at the door, my wife and I went across. Norm was crying, his wife was crying, his brother Len Smith was crying, he was crying, so Glenn and I joined in. <laughs> it really was like a, a death of the family. That uh, Here's a coach that had taken a club into the, into the VFL, the 10 consecutive final series, winning six and being runners up once. And how the club could do that was uh, was unforgivable. I recall on the Saturday um, we played North Melbourne at Coburg. In those days, this day was a very very wet day, and I can recall the president coming up to me and saying, "As captain, that I was not to appear on television the next day." Which in those days, world sport, every captain basically went on world sport. I was told that if I appeared on television and supported Norm, 
my captaincy was in jeopardy. And I just told him to uh, rack off. And, uh, I would be peering to put him on. It was, a, it was a period with you captaining 65 to 68 and it just seemed to be, I guess, a moment in time for Melbourne because from that moment onwards, the club would not play finals again until 1987. Yeah, well, I guess in 1964, we had to win 64 if we were going to win a premiership because it was the last year of the era of those players that came through. We lost a number in 62, 63, 64. But uh, 62, 63, 64, it was going to be Brassy last year. Uh, it was going to be Dixon's and Adams's last year. And we really had to win that one um, because it was the end of an era. That was one of the reasons why Norm Smith got sacked. It was because Norm could foresee what was happening with the club, that the experience was going, and he was critical of the board for the recruiting people mainly the board, for not um, seeking out recruits over the previous first two or three years, sorry, the last three, two or three years of that period, to um, build up the stocks in the club. And uh, because of his strength and his abuse of the, not so much abuse, but his criticism of the board for not recruiting well, um, he was seen as too dominant. He was seen as being successful, taking the next step to be too dominant, but um, it was one of the reasons that he fell out of favour with a number of the board members. And also there were a couple of players who I think had made some, um, some bad, unjust criticism of Norm, probably mainly because they weren't getting a game, but uh, that was taken on board by the committee also. And, uh, Hence the reason he was uh, he was sacked. It was an interesting time, not only with uh, Norm, but also uh, Ron Barassi going across from Melbourne to Carlton. I think at that time I heard of was such a, a superstar player jumping from one club to the other. I think there were stories at the time of kids that had had a 31 Melbourne jumper crying because their hero had crossed to Carlton. Yeah, it was a, uh, a, a period. Again, uh, just the type of guy Norm Smith was. Norm didn't want Ron to leave Melbourne and uh, Ron was offered the coaching position uh, at Melbourne by Norm. He was prepared to stand aside for Brassie. But Ron felt it was uh, important that one, he didn't want Smith to finish coaching and two, uh, he felt that he had to make that break to maybe later come back and coach Melbourne, which he did. Uh, but uh, Norm was prepared to stand aside for Ron and uh, uh, he was probably the first player that jumped ship, uh, and it was hard on Ron. I know Ron took it very, very hard. But Melbourne was his life. His father played with Melbourne and was killed in the war. Um, perhaps he just loved Melbourne. Um, to go away was a, I guess, uh, a great challenge for him. And the worst thing he could do was, would be to give Brassie a challenge because he knew, knew damn well that. He was give his all to make sure that he, he was successful at it. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting time. Thank God he went though, I got captain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's, there's a rumour at the end. Now, um, before we talk about yourself jumping to the waffle, let's just briefly touch on uh, some of the players you played against in the VFL. Who would be the toughest opponent that you had? Touched opponent probably was a guy who um, um, got some recognition, a uh, guy called uh, uh, Ian Stewart, only won three for yeah. last yeah. Uh, uh, I found that early in my career, or the middle of my career, I was able to handle Stewart reasonably well, but at the end uh, Stewie was uh, a very, very tough opponent to, to play on, um, very skilled. Very quick and uh, didn't need many kicks to uh, make a fool of him. And obviously, you played against South Melbourne, which is a number of poor uh, fans who also followed uh, the Swans when there were Souths. You played against the likes of uh, there was uh, Frank Johnson Senior, of course, from Port Melbourne, who went to uh, South Melbourne, and uh, one called the Chip Bob Skelton. Uh, we, uh, yeah, well, I knew Bobby very well. We played uh, a lot of state footy together, and uh, 
always love playing interstate footy with, with Bob. I guess you're alluding to the story where one day we played against uh, South and Norm came up. I knew said Smithy, but he didn't like the word Smithy. Norm came up and said, I've got a special job here today. Oh, yeah. He said, I want you to play on skill. I said, oh, shit, you know. <laughs> and he said, uh, no, see, as long as he's on the ball, I want you to be on the ball. Okay, Norm, so first quarter, we rode the whole quarter. Second quarter, we rode the whole quarter. And Norm said, half time, keep it up, mate, keep it up, you're doing well. I said, oh, I'm bugging, you know, he said, keep it up. Third quarter, we played, rode the whole quarter. And the last quarter, I said to Scoop about 10 minutes ago, for Christ's sake, Bobby, go and have a rest. <laughs> Bobby started running off to the forward pocket. I started walking back to the forward pocket. Next minute, the runner's out, he's back on the ball. <laughs> I rode the whole game. And uh, after the game, we uh, were sitting down having a, a drink together. I said, Scoops, I said, yeah. You're a bastard. I said, don't, don't you talk. I said, geez, I said, you know, my instructions today were, as long as you're on the ball, I was on the ball. He said, oh, no. <laughs> he was given the same instructions. <laughs> It was a great group of football, wasn't it? When, when you talk about other names like uh, that played in that area, like I, I think of Royce Hart, Polly Farmer, EJ Whitmore playing during that era. Yeah, Whitmore was an interesting character. Again, great to play with Ted. He just lived for safe football. And uh, uh, remember my first game, Ted said to me, he said, now listen, mate, he said, uh, congratulations on making the Victorian side. Thanks, Ted. He said, now, if you play your cards right, mate, he said, you can be in the Victorian side for a number of years. He said, sometimes it's harder to get out than get in. He said, uh, if you play your cards right, he said, I said, I'll play my cards right, who's the joker? He said, me. He said, when you get in the centre, he said, get the ball, kick it to me. He said, run past, I hand pass. He said, I get a stat, you get two. <laughs> At that time, we were playing pretty well, and uh, he came up and he said, keep it up, he said, uh, he said, you're playing well. I said, you're not playing bad yourself, Ted. Uh, he said, keep it up. So in the third quarter, same thing happens, and just before three quarters time, we get the ball on the half-back line, kick it to Witten, he marks the ball, he props, waits for me to go past, and I'm like, <laughs> couldn't make it. So Ted, in an imitable way, goes back, kicks the ball, a lovely 60 metre torpedo punt, straight through. And he comes up and he said, uh, Where were you? I said, Mate, I couldn't make it. I was gone. And you know, I said, That's it. He said, No more. The so next time I get it, I kick it to him. I go past, he props. Never came. <laughs> Sorry, mate, he said. Yeah, that's it. So uh, Whitman was uh, always looking after himself and also other young players too. Uh, after your adventures uh, over the state team and with Melbourne, you went to South Fremantle in 69. How did that come about, you going across the other side of the number ball? I played in the uh, state side against WA in 1968. And it was after that game I was approached by the two Fremantle sides to, uh, to coach. I mean, I had no intentions of, of coaching. I wanted to play. Um, I, I was a 10-year player with Melbourne and four-year captain and really loved the Melbourne footy, footy club. So I went back to Jim Carter and I said, I've been approached by the two Fremantle sides to coach. I don't want to go. I, uh, I, I want to play and continue playing with Melbourne, but of like a two-year contract. Now Melbourne were not into contracts at all and uh, I said all I want is a two-year contract. I want to play my 200 games with the club and, and more. Uh, I was told at the age of 27 that uh, the chairman selector didn't think that I had two years left 
in, in football with Melbourne. So I thank him very much. He said, you've made my decision. I'll go and coach South Fremantle and I'll play the against Victoria the next two years. Well, the WA side, and in the end, just to, to show that, of course, you've still the peak of your powers, you won the best and fairest the next year, 69 at South Fremantle, and then, of course, coached them to the flag in 70. Well, I took on South Fremantle because they were a very young side, and I thought that, that uh, maybe I could do something. Um, our first year with South Fremantle, we won five games only, finished stone, bottomless, last. Uh, at the end of the 59 year, I went to the board and said to the South Fremantle board that uh, I wasn't happy um, with my fellow selectors. I wanted to be a sole selector, and uh, they said, well, you're putting your neck on the line, we don't agree with it. And I said, well, if I don't be sole selector, I don't coach. Because the previous year, I wasn't able to get my team on the on the park every, every week, and I felt that some of the selectors had, um, um, uh, had seen play, play for so long, they had things against the players, and I wanted to give them a go. I sacked six players who played for the state, who were getting the end of their career, and went with a team of kids, and uh, we went from bottomless last to winning the premiership in 1970, which was a great thrill. And a very, very rare feat, I think, at any level of football. Yeah, it was, and uh, it's marvellous that only last summer I had a reunion with, uh, with most of those boys and uh, to see young kids, to see them get this thrill of being able to play in a premiership side is, uh, is, is tremendous. And those that have played in premiership sides, you know, you uh, create a bond for life. And so just quickly before we get on to current day Melbourne issues, the Galar, 67, I think it's the Harry Gossel team that uh, went to Ireland and the USA. How, how did that, the concept come about and how did you get roped in to play for the Galars? I think Harry was uh, seen as a, a bit of a forward thinker and he felt that there was some similarity between the Irish Gaelic football and also the, the Australian AFL uh, um, football. He determined that he would like to take a side across to play. Um, he had a wonderful side, it was almost a Victorian side that he took across and uh, we, we only trained um, um, not very much at all before we went across but we had some terrific competitors the rest of his coach and that was up in itself and yet guys like Polly Farmer, Skills played and uh, uh, John Nichols. We went across, uh, we played the All-Ireland runners-up and we beat them. We played the All-Ireland champions, County Kerry, and we beat them. Uh, and then there was a guy there, a guy there, a New York Irishman, who challenged us to go to New York to take on the New York Irish. We had no intentions of going there because Harry was running out of money. And, uh, um, but we said, he put it to us and we said we would, we, we would go for a trip to New York. <laughs> Why not come back? So we had played at the New York Irish and uh, we played on this ground that was owned by this Irish American billionaire uh, on this ground that had, you could count the blades of brass, you could, the rocks were that big. Um, we played them and uh, we were beaten. We lost the game, we lost the fight. Remember Brassie came in at half time and saying, I can't stand those bastards out there. He said, they're, they're beating us. And he said, follow me. So we went out after half time and this typical Ronnie picks the biggest guy and uh, goes to sort of knock him over and the guy's gone whack, hit him on the nose and pushed his nose across the other side of his face. So, so Brassie sort of goes, sees red and flies him like a little cock sparrow. You know? And as he flown and hit him back, this guy's gone bang, 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 pushed his nose from one side to the other. And I said, shit, you know, we'll, we'll give that away. And, uh, you know, we, we, we lost that game and uh, with five seconds to go, I had my jaw broken in three places. And one, uh, one of the guys, uh, 
uh, came from behind and hit me on the point of the chin and broke it there, there and there. So I came home uh, feeling sad and sorry. That was a terrific trip. <laughs> So just before we, we let you go, uh, Melbourne at the moment, the, the side sitting second last, there's almost every week after every game, there's always speculation, there's always talk about what's going there. Tom McClarty's now just stepped down. How, how do you see things panning out for Melbourne in, in the next few years? Well, having sort of served the club from player to uh, director, coach of the under-19s to a, uh, the CEO, um, one could be no, no more disappointed than I to see Melbourne where they are at the moment. Having played in the glory years when Melbourne were, were the club, to have a club that is the oldest AFL, VFL football club, in fact the oldest football club in the world, to see them down and out uh, as they are at the moment is terribly disappointing. I cannot see a, a, a quick remedy to it. I mean, I think that Clubs can get down and they get down very, very low. I think they're at their lowest ebb they have ever, ever been. And it's going to be a long, long uh, period before the club recovers. Um, I think the club has been, um, we've had so many, since Ian Ridley died, um, we've had the, the merger, um, we've had so many presidents and coaches since that. Uh, the club is just, just down and I think our recruiting has been very poor over the last five years. I mean, we've had the opportunity with the picks that we've had in the draft to be a top side. But uh, we've recruited badly, we haven't recruited to our needs. And, uh, and of course this year we couldn't have had any more luck than the two prize recruits in the last couple of years in Clark and Dawes have been on the park. I mean. Clark, who looks as though could be a very, very good player, has played about 10 games out of 30. And 700,000 a year, you expect a bit more than that. Um, but um, it's, going to be, it's going to be interesting over the next month. Uh, I hope the coach survives. I mean, it's, one can be critical of the coach uh, in some instances, but he's only really had a, an impact in recruiting, I think last year he, he sacked uh, 14 players, he brought his own people in, uh, and he should be judged at the end of this year more so than being judged as he's at the moment. Uh, it's going to be a long year to be beaten on a regular occurrence by plus 100 points per game. Uh, it's, it, it's just a terrible, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that I can't see any light at the end of the tunnel in the next uh, two or three years. It, it must be heartbreaking for the supporters. I mean, I, I think the iconic image was a few years ago, a few, pardon me, a few weeks ago, when the a Melbourne supporter was shown waving a white flag in the grandstand. I mean, for them, they've been waiting a long time for uh, the Melbourne to win a flag. Last time in the grand final in 2000, for them, it must be tough not yet seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The sad thing is that uh, a very good friend of mine, only last week rang me up and said that he's got twin boys that have been to the football since they've been five years of age and uh, they're now 15. They said to their father the other day that I don't want to go to football. <laughs> and I think that is that is synonymous to a number of, um, of, of many supporters at the moment. I mean, we read in the paper that if you're not winning games, if you're not winning games, people don't come along to see you. And that's being reflected in the attendances where Melbourne's getting 12 or 13,000 or 16,000 people at a game. At the MCG, you need something like 22,000 people to break even with expenses. And uh, all what's happening with Melbourne now is not getting that number of crowds. They look like losing something like $3 million this year. Now, that's something that uh, the club can't afford at any stage. No club can afford that. Indeed, I think for the sake of the competition, we all hope that Melbourne get back up there again. So therefore, we need.
a good for football, particularly the Melbourne brand itself, being uh, the capital city of Victoria. Uh, has it just before we let you go, I might call upon Peter Bromley, the president of the Four Melbourne Football Club, to make a special presentation. Thanks, Hassan. That's been a great speech. Great to hear your views, and especially on the Melbourne Football Club and their current situation. I'd like to present you with a, a tie to add to your red and blue collection. And I hope you have an opportunity to wear it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Borough TV is a Port Melbourne Football Club production.